Welcome to the future where the glass is half full and you'll need new glasses, where you'll be jumping from conclusions. The past is a no, and a new future is born. Never before in history has so much meant so little to so many. AD on the radio. So, you know, the rest of the world and how they're absolutely affected by everything we do here in America. America is America is a country that uh, we've described it this way in the past, and I think it's very appropriate. We sneeze. The rest of the world is in danger of catching a cold. We do well financially. The rest of the world stands a better chance of doing well out of it. Our economy is hit hard. Well, that's going to send shockwaves through the finances of people around the globe. And I don't know if you've got too many friends that are overseas at the moment. But the overseas, outsiders, foreigners' perspective on what's going on in America during this election in 2016 is an interesting one. Have you ever taken a painting class? One thing that they're going to tell you to do in any kind of art class where you're up close, you're sketching in details, you're painting, you're doing all these sorts of things or what have you. They tell you to take a step back because you're right up there. It's two inches away from your nose. You're focused. You're, you're, you're concentrating. You're trying to get every little detail right. But occasionally, if you don't take a moment to take a step back, you can miss what's going on with the big picture. Up close, it looks like something to you. From just a couple of steps back, it looks like something completely different. And any art teacher worth their salt will tell you to take a couple steps back every now and then. Try and gain the benefit of perspective by not peering in quite so closely and not focusing on the minutia, which really matters to you. Oh, it's really, really important that I get the perspective on this building, right? Because that's, that's what's important to me, perspective. I really want to show the world that I know how to deal with perspective. It's a really tough thing to tackle, and if I can get it right, then I will be respected as an artist. Meanwhile, you might be letting the of the drawing go to hell, or the painting go to hell, and people aren't really all that impressed by the fact that you know how to do perspective correctly because your flowers are all out of whack, or whatever the hell the case may be in this particular analogy. But it's important sometimes to take a step back and see your work, how other people see it. And if you take a step back, if you talk to some friends overseas, if you talk to some friends in other countries about what's going on in America at the moment, where really there's less speculation, there's less conjecture, there's just sort of fact after fact after fact reported. I'm not saying that reporting isn't biased in other countries, but it's just that they're not as invested. They don't care as much. They care because, like I said, America sneezes, the rest of the world gets a cold, but they don't care as much. They've got their own lives to live. They've got their own problems. They've got their own idiotic politicians that take up the bulk of their time and worry. But if you talk to people in other countries, and let's be clear on this. I'm not saying other countries have it figured out in a way we don't. But if you talk to people in other countries, sometimes you get a bit of a more balanced perspective. And the perspective that I've gotten when speaking to friends of mine that live in Europe, in Holland, in the Netherlands, in Sweden, in England, in Japan, as I have done recently. I mean, it's just kind of come up. It's cool. I've got friends all over the world, and for a long time, we weren't really in that great... Uh, we, we weren't in contact like I would have wished I, I would have been with them, with some of my friends that are dotted around the world. But, you know, digital and social media make things a lot easier when it comes to maintaining those sorts of relationships. So I have ongoing conversations with lots of my friends dotted all over the globe, and that's really cool, and I really enjoy that. And yay, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, that's something that you did that I appreciate. But another thing that I appreciate is the benefit, benefit of perspective. And in our ongoing conversations, which 
have all of a sudden taken a turn for the political as they watch what's unfolding in America. The general consensus from people that I speak to in other countries with regard to the presidential election in 2016, the general consensus tends to be, if you're, uh, if you're talking to one of my friends in England, tends to be, what is going on over there? Nobody can freaking believe it. They're just like, it, it's a comedy of freaking errors. And it took, uh, it took a conversation with one of my buddies in Japan to enlighten me as to certain aspects of the Ted Cruz, Donald Trump feud that are happening at the moment. What are they? We'll get into it next. Thank you for hanging out. Where the left and right come together for fundamental truths. AD on the radio, on Twitter at ADSXE. So friends of mine from all over the world have been kind of checking in. We talk on a regular basis, but some of them have been checking in a little bit more frequently now. Going, <laughs> what, the, what, the, what the hell is up with you people? I'm like, hey, 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 don't, uh, don't, don't hold it against yours truly. Differentiate in your mind, if you will, the American political process and the American people. And I'm like, all right, okay, cool. But what the hell is going on over there? I was like, is, is that how the world sees it? Is that how the world sees it? Are we a ridiculous comedy of errors in America? And they're like, well, we think it's funny. We think it's funny, but we're extraordinarily worried for the end result. And it's making people go, okay, when it comes to anything sensible or useful or strategically aligned with the United States of America, we might have to count them out until 2020. I was like, that, that's, the pervading, uh, that's the pervading rationale in the rest of the world. Based on what's going on in America in 2016, we might not be able to count on them for anything good for the next four years. They're like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's sort of like, yeah, who knows what the hell is going on over there. And we need those little shakeups sometimes to correct the future of a country. But a lot of people feel as though America has reached a tipping point. I'm about to go off a ledge after which a certain amount of reconstruction will be necessary when it comes to the next election. Anyways. If it is a comedy of errors, there have been some beautiful zingers at the moment. And I hate, I hate, hate, hate gotcha journalism. So stupid. So freaking stupid. The gotchas should be left to folks like me, the satirists, the people who exercise our God-given right, given to us by God and Larry Flint, to use a tool of satire to get closer to the truth. But when folks like Fox and CNN and people that purport to be respectable news outlets practice gotcha journalism, I don't think it does anything to move the ball of humanity further down the field. I don't think it helps anybody. I don't think it's constructive. I don't think it's acting with America's best interests at heart. And I think it's stupid and irresponsible. That said, it was almost never done more beautifully than when Ted Cruz was responding to Trump's retweet over their respective wives on CNN. Hold on, check this out. I don't know if you've caught it or not, but uh, have a listen. It's not easy to tick me off. Don't get angry off. But you mess with my wife, you mess with my kids, that'll do it every time. Donald, you're a sniveling coward and leave Heidi the hell alone. So will you support him as the nominee? Oh! For the nomination. He is not. Burn. Burn. A question that presupposes that Ted Cruz's campaign is over. And you know what? Credit where credit is due. I don't want to get uh, I don't want to get grief for not um, for not including what his further response was to it. But he did recover beautifully. But the look on his face. Oof. 
But he got it right back up and started swinging. I am answering the question. Donald Trump will not be the nominee. When he gets scared, he screams, he yells, often he curses, and he insults and attacks whoever is standing near him. And you're right, Donald does seem to have an issue with women. Donald doesn't like strong women. I mean, strong women scare Donald. Now, Donald is scared a lot these days. Donald is scared to debate. He ran away from the last debate that was scheduled because he was scared of Megyn Kelly and because he was scared to defend his policies. Listen, Donald doesn't know much about foreign policy. The day before the Brussels terror attack, Donald called for America effectively withdrawing from NATO. That is utter foolishness. It would hand a massive victory to Putin and to ISIS. That weakness and unilateral surrender is indicative of someone that doesn't have a basic understanding of foreign policy. That's why Donald is afraid of debates. Because at debate... Anyways, seeing as our internet has decided to, for the most part, not cooperate as it often does a la Monday, we'll leave it at that. But, uh, yeah. Uh, it, it was a brilliant moment of gotcha journalism. Ted Cruz looked like he'd been kicked directly in the uh, cr- kicked directly in the unmentionable south of the equator, but he recovered brilliantly. But this is what we've come come to. My wife's hot. Your wife isn't. Trump, you're a sniveling coward. Leave my wife the hell alone. And then you got to bear in mind that this is what the rest of the world sees from the outside looking in. We're people that, uh, well, you know, you know what it's like. It's like if you have friends, neighbors, acquaintances, people you know that you kind of like. You kind of like, you know, they're you can deal with them. They're part of your life, and but they always seem to be doing stupid stuff. There's like the guy who is at the bar and starts beef with someone else, and you've been dragged into it so many times. You've been dragging. You've you've had to separate your friend from another friend from some rando that's ready to slice his face open with a broken bottle one too many times, and you're just kind of done with it. You're over it, and you've decided to take a step back until they figure their stuff out. That's how the rest of the world is looking at America right now, and for that reason, it's very very important. That you remain true to yourself. You define who the hell you are. And you do not let yourself get lumped in and separated from the American people and be considered part of the American political process. Don't get the blues, get all the news. We mean all of you guys out there in Radio Land. All aboard! He's back. AD on the radio. Give it up, yeah. Give it up, yeah. Bring this on, bring this on. Come on, come on. Here I come again, coming again, taking it back to the place where I'm picking up the pen. And before I started, it's already a killer. When you know the chicken, I gotta say that it's a thriller. Hey, I do it. So, 12 year old, 12 year old girl has been charged with, I believe, a sexual battery. Why? Because she pinched a dude's butt in class. Yeah, true story. It's a thing. It happened. Sexual battery for this. I want you to think back for a moment. I want you to think back for a second. About what it was like when you were 12, 13. When you were kind of figuring things out. I mean, look, years later, I still feel like I'm figuring things out. I don't know if I'm any closer. But there's a period of your life, I guess, you know, right when your hormones start to get carbonated. And uh, all that matters to you, all that matters to you tends to be the object of your physical affection. Paying attention in math class goes straight the hell out the window. And you become fixed. You become obsessed. You become... You become absolutely ensconced in the idea of what it might be like underneath those clothes. What hides underneath that sweater. The idea that maybe one day you might possibly get to see and or touch a boob. And... This is the same for boys and girls. 
it's a confusing time, which, quite frankly, I wouldn't repeat for any money in the world. But one thing that I remember kind of thinking about being 12, 13, 14 years old, before people caught up to the size of their feet. These poor kids had their growth spurts late, but their feet got huge. And all of a sudden, they went from being their school star soccer player to tripping over their size elevens when they're only four foot eight or whatever the hell it was. It's just everything is all messed up. It's a confusing, awful time. If you're like I was in the sixth grade, your face explodes. I think my best friend, my best friend growing up, Billy, he came up to me one morning in the sixth grade, and my skin just went bananas went crazy no no idea what happened it calmed down pretty quickly afterwards but there was a there was a two three month period in the in the sixth and seventh grade where my skin just erupted <laughs> i remember my best friend best friends being what they are in the sixth grade came up to me and pointed at my face he was like <laughs> it's like counting stars i was like thanks a lot dude you're a jerk and he was like seriously it looked like someone took a spaghetti strainer held it over your face and then went after it with some red spray paint i was like thank you thank you very much we're still best friends to this day by the way but your body goes crazy your mind goes crazy and you know what you're doing you're kind of trying stuff out you're kind of relating to members of the opposite sex or same sex if you start to roll that way in a different way you're trying to figure out interpersonal relationships you're trying to figure out how to talk to girls you're trying to figure out how to talk to guys you're trying to figure out how you're going to get along before you were just one kid and another kid in the sandbox and now everything's starting to change and you're starting to try and figure out this new dynamic i remember there was this thing in my school where girls were slapping guys for a little while you pig <laughs> And some kid had seen it in some movie and decided it was a thing to do. Well, this clearly, as an adult, you don't slap a bunch of people in the face when they say something that vaguely offends you. But for a while, I don't know how it started. I don't know why it stopped. But for about a eh, a three, four week period, I remember I I never got slapped because I was always polite to a fault. But (laughs) I remember there was this brief period of time where like girls slapped guys. You pig slap and guys went, (laughs) she slapped me. I think she likes me. It's a weird time that makes absolutely no sense in anyone's life. You're trying to figure things out. You're experimenting with things. Is it cool to slap people? Uh, No, no, it's not. That makes no sense. It really doesn't achieve anything. And you know what? The slapping phenomena in my school, girls stopped doing that really quickly. I don't ever remember a teacher intervening. It was just something that was a passing fad, a bit of a passing fancy in a young woman's mind as she was trying to figure out how she was going to relate to people. Oh, am I going to relate to people by slapping them? Well, that doesn't seem to work too well. I'm not going to be doing that anymore. So 12 years old, this is an age where people are trying things out. They're trying to figure out their way in life. They're trying to figure out this new dynamic. They're trying to figure out how they relate to opposite sex or or the members of the opposite sex or members of the same sex sometimes if you roll that way. And the idea that a kid the idea that a kid could be hauled into the cop shop for sexual battery at the age of 12 for doing what this girl did to this guy to me boggles my mind maybe i'm not being sensitive enough to the situation you can tell me when we talk about it later right now the funk houser let's address what's going on in the world hello what Hi, what is what? my huh? witness news Ooh. In no way, shape, or form, fair and certainly not balanced. And now, super producer to the stars, Barry Funkhauser. Oh, hey. Oh, hey, hi. What's up? How are you? I was just in there preparing news, that's why. I right. wasn't in front of the... If by preparing news, you mean working on the Nikki Six show? Would that be correct? Were you working on the Nikki Six show? Whatever do you mean? <laughs> it's okay. He, he's he's. I don't know what you're talking about. Click 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 oh. click 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 click. Oh, click, this click, is click. just perfect. You know, like let, let's just call call it what it is here today. Um, the internet doesn't work. It's raining. Uh, the browser keeps crashing. I can't see the stuff that I've made notes on. Uh, I can't play pieces of audio or video. Uh, The studio, for some reason, is death-defyingly hot. It's like doing radio in Cambodia. I feel like Adrian Cronauer in Good Morning Vietnam. It is unequivocally 
a Monday here today. So if things sound like an absolute, if, if it sounds like I'm ready to kill somebody, um, I'm, I'm going to be real with you. I, I, you know that whole don't let them see you sweat thing? Funkhauser, that idea of like, don't let, don't let people see you sweat. Yeah, yeah. Um, when you're actually sweating, when the sweat isn't metaphorical, when it's actually trickling down the back of your neck, because when it's actually trickling down the back of your neck because somebody in their infinite wisdom has decided to set the studio thermostat to a, to a toasty 90 degrees, it feels like when you're actually sweating, I'm just going to be real with it. I, I, think that's, I think that's the right thing to do. I think this show is the closest thing on the radio to real life. I really do. I think we, we're, we're real talk. We're concerned with real people. We're not concerned with posturing. We are what we are. And that is, at all times, as real as possible. And uh, so, yeah. Therefore, in the spirit of being real, um, let me just tell you, nothing works here today and it's uncomfortably hot. And uh, I'm about home. to F and lose it. Let's just go um, home. Here, here. Let's go home. Oh, no. We can't. We have to be here. We can't. Have to be here. Have to be here. Have to be here. Can't scroll through um, what I'm doing. Oh, Jesus. I can tell you what I did yesterday. I, my uh, battery went dead. In your car? Yeah. Yeah, brand new battery. Want to know why? Uh, yeah, I would. Uh, do, do, so, well, leave your lights on? N- well, so the Canadian is learning how to drive, you know, and we're at a point <laughs> where uh, you have to parallel park. You know, the parallel parking, all you have to do is, like, you know, park on the curb. Right. Well, so we, we've been practicing that, and last uh, over the weekend, we went out of town. We went to a beach town, and... Um, you know, very far away from home. And I said, you know, now's a good chance for you. To, let's switch a route. You get in the driver's seat and you park the car. Go ahead. Well, I I didn't uh, I didn't notice that he turned the lights on in that, you know, two second situation to park the car. And then the lights were on and the battery was dead. Click. Click. So, yeah. I, so you're stranded in a beach town far away from home and your battery battery's, battery's dead. dead. Boom. And uh, some guy's like, hey, the lights are on in that car. So, so yeah, I had to deal with that. Luckily, I was a AAA member, and they were like, thanks for your four years of service. We'll have somebody ride out. Oh, really? Yeah. And that actually like, worked? 20 minutes after I found out it was dead, I was back on the road. This is nice. not a commercial. Very cool. Yeah. Very it was, cool. It was, uh, you know, worked out. AAA, making up for the mistakes of Canadians everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God. All right, let's just do Did the Did I news. stall enough? Like, we got it? No, no, nothing's better. Nothing's fixed. I, re- I really appreciate what you did there, and it was a great okay. story, and it's very sure. interesting, and it makes me think that I'm going to uh, get myself a triple A membership, but uh, no, it helped nothing. So let's just muddle on as best we freaking can today. Despite bad reviews, Batman vs. Superman is doing fantastic. No spoilers. Hmm. I'm going to see it tonight. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I, w- I wanted to go see it over the weekend. But I was just like, I'm not, I'm not, no, that won't be a thing. I will not be doing this. I won't be going opening weekend to one of the biggest movies of all time. It doesn't matter that the reviews are calling it a giant dumpster fire. It will be packed. So I was like, nah, nah, I, I can't, I cannot deal with that at a theater over the weekend. I, I, so I haven't seen it either. I'm gonna, though, without a shadow of a doubt. But yeah, got horrific reviews, still doing fanta- fantastic. Kind of like a certain orange presidential candidate that we, uh, <laughs> Get them out. Go on. A survey found that Batman vs. Superman audiences preferred Batman over Superman. Mm. And I hear in another survey they preferred colonoscopies to seeing the movie again. (laughs) Yeah, I hear that. I'm not happy about seeing it. Why are you going to see it then? Who? Oh, being, Canadian Jane works. Being dragged and, and, along with a bunch of people. Hey, let's go see it and how bad it is. Oh, sounds great. Yeah. But I don't know. I think it might be good. Like, it is sort of like there. there is a lot of star power in it, though. You know, it's one of those things where it's like it's like a super group. It's like a super group. These ensemble movies like the Avengers and stuff, it's it's like a super group. It's like uh, when Jack Blades and Tommy Shaw of Styx hooked up with Ted Nugent and formed that band Damn Yankees. Oh, yeah. You know, like, oh, yeah. Expectations are really, really high. Or when, you know, 
Chris Cornell from Soundgarden got together with the rest of the guys from Rage Against the Machine when Zach Della Roca quit and became their new singer and they became Audio Slave. Everyone's like, oh man, what's it going to sound like? It's going to be amazing. It's, uh, well, it sounds like Rage Against the Machine with the guy from Soundgarden. I think singing. it's more it's like. good, I guess. I think it's more like when he got with Timbaland. Oh. <laughs> That's a better uh, example. You know, of, uh, a lot of people, a lot of people call that album a bit of a dumpster fire, and I have to say, in hindsight, there's a couple songs on there that I really, really like, and I, I know this because I'm like sitting there watching some television show on Netflix a, a little while ago. I'm like, this song kicks ass. What is this? I was like, oh, this is that, this is that that record that Chris Cornell made with Timbaland, and it's not like it didn't do well, but I just think it didn't fit anywhere. Like, it was an attempt at doing something. It was very ambitious, and I think people give that record a hard time. But if you go back and listen to it with fresh ears a few years later, I I don't think it's the uh, crushing disappointment you thought it was. I think it just didn't do well because it was so out there. It didn't fit in. Yeah, and that's what we like. That's what we like here in America. On the radio in general, like, we're a country that celebrates the idea of individual liberties. It's supposed to be a nation of individuals, but really, really, what we like to support is joiners. And look, I love radio. Radio is great. And radio is a reflection, really, of the people listening to it. And there's times where people go, how come you can't play an Ornette Coleman record or a John Coltrane record next to a BC Boys record? Well, in my house, you can. But people like to know what they're getting when they get into it. A lot of folks in this country, and look, if I could program an esoteric radio station that did go John Coltrane into Ornette Coleman, into the Beastie Boys, into Soundgarden, I would, and it would be awesome. But it would make no money, and I wish that wasn't the case, but it was. People don't know what they like. They like what they know when it comes to listening. And that is why Chris Cornell's record did not do so well. And we really need things dumbed down and formatted for us in this country. Can you tell it's a Monday and I'm angry at literally everything and everyone? <laughs> yeah, it's I'm just, just like, yeah. I'm letting you, I'm not touching any of that. You just, yeah, you yeah, you just probably shouldn't because, yep. you know, when the hammer falls, <laughs> you don't want it falling on you after today's tirade. <laughs> But it's it's totally true. People need things neatly packaged up. They need things with clearly defined lines and barriers that can be easily understood. They need to feel like they can jump on one side of a political fence and make an easy decision and you know, then absolve themselves from the perils of having to think for themselves after they're going like, I'm a registered this, I'm a registered that. So too bad, so sad. I'm sorry, Chris Cornell, because we as Americans tend to like things overly simplified because we've been trained to be dumbed down systematically over the years. For that reason, your record with Timberland didn't do anywhere near as well as it should have. Oh, it's definitely a Monday, isn't it? Holy freaking God. AD on the radio. I got an email. Got an email from Chris in Port St. Lucie, Florida, who's listening to the show now, saying that uh, that radio station you're talking about, the one that plays the Beastie Boys and Ornette Coleman, sounds awesome. If you made it, I would totally listen. Well, yeah, here's the thing. If you're listening to this show, chances are you're a bit of a thinker. You believe in what you feel. You know where you're on. You know who the hell you are. You know what the hell you're about. You don't need to be dumbed down. You don't need to be marginalized by being, you don't need to be negated by being defined. You don't need to swear allegiance to one side of the political fence and then absolve yourself from the burden of critical thinking for the rest of your time because I'm like, oh, click, I'm a registered Democrat. Click, I'm a registered Republican. No, chances are, if you're listening to this station, you are an appreciator of the fact that, you know, hearing the Dave Brubeck Quartet into Public Enemy or the BC Boys into Ornette Coleman or Slayer into Pat Metheny would probably be a pretty cool experience. I like all of these things. That'd be awesome. But the sad fact of it is, 
to the people that are messaging me saying that would be an awesome radio station they would listen to is the vast majority of us. I won't say us because this is an exclusive little club we've got going on here at the moment. The vast majority of the people in the world, but let's just focus on America for a second. Aren't as bright as you. They're really not. They're really just not as bright as you. They're really not as self-possessed as you. Look, if you're the type of person that needs to turn on talk radio so you can verbatim regurgitate what the hell somebody who's telling you what to think says, then this is clearly not the show for you. And if you've stuck with us for any length of time, you know this. One of the best things that can happen one of the best things that can happen in this situation is somebody disagrees with me and we have a conversation. Not interested into and not interested in evangelizing to acquire people that already believe what I tell them to. Not interested in talking to a room full of folks that think everything I say is right all the time. Interested in engaging people interested in learning something from you interested in giving something back to a community interested in having a conversation interested most of the time in hearing with people that disagree with me why because folks that agree with me i'm not going to learn a whole lot from them it's great that we believe the same stuff makes it easier to high five each other and get along but i'm not learning a whole lot in those situations. So if you are someone that's listened to the show for any length of time, I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that you have your own thoughts. You don't always agree with what I say, but you get something out of this conversation and you feel as though we as a species, we're doing our little part to evolve us as a species through having these conversations every single day. And I thank you for hanging out. So yeah. Sorry to our friend in Port St. Lucie, Florida. It doesn't look like I'm going to be able to uh, give you that Slayer, Pat Metheny, or Nat Coleman Beastie Boys radio station anytime really soon. But I appreciate that you, like a select handful of people, would like to listen to it. Because you know what? I think I would too. All right, then. Let's uh, continue with the news, Funkhauser. Yet another window on my computer has crashed, so let's just make it up as we go. Uh, my side is in the news. She's going to be a coach on The Voice. Uh huh. Yeah, my side. And by the way, as always, uh, if you use the expression my side, as opposed to Miley Cyrus, her full and given name, Funkhauser, I insist that for the rest of the day you swish around in a pretty little pastel dress. <laughs> but here's Fine. the thing <laughs> have it here, steamed it over the weekend. It's right Maybe there. It's yeah. coming. <laughs> Miley Cyrus is going to be a coach on The Voice. And, and here's a little tip for potential voice contestants that are going to be judged by Miley Cyrus. She'll turn her, around, her, she'll turn her, hair, uh, her chair around immediately the very second she smells pot. Just FYI. <laughs> go. <laughs> uh, go on. Uh, despite, uh, the Daytime Emmy Award nominations are out. Yeah. <laughs> what? Is there still yeah. a thing? Yeah, it's amazing, amazing oh, award ceremonies for so television awards. Just like nothing that happens after. What's a cutoff? Like, what time do you have to be on to be a daytime Emmy, Emmy award nominee? Like, is it I think five? It's, is it's it six? From, is it seven? It used to be from Regis to Ellen. For me, but, <laughs> no, I don't know. Sounds like the title of the worst porno movie ever. <laughs> uh, daytime Emmy nominations are out. You know. You know, I, I have an inkling about those. I don't usually give much thought to awards, but if it's the daytime Emmys that we're talking about, I have a good idea who will win best pandering bald half-wit fake doctor. Yep, I got a, I got a hunch on that one. Schmachter Schmill. Go on. I don't understand anything you just said there. Why don't you have a seat? <laughs> uh, Radiohead and the Red Hot Chili Peppers will headline this year's Lollapalooza. Uh, you ever been yeah. to that thing? Uh, Lollapalooza? Yeah. No. Yeah, no, I never either. have. No, there was one year where my band was going to play Lollapalooza, and then we got... It was one of those things where it's like, if you play this festival, you can't play that festival. And we, you know, like, it's a one-shot deal. And we wound up opting not to play Lollapalooza. We played something else, which is probably a mistake, but there you go. 
Um, continue, if you would be so kind. Fine. Gwyneth Paltrow has officially divorced Chris Martin. Yeah, yeah. Gwyneth Paltrow has officially divorced Chris Martin. She is consciously uncoupled from Chris Martin. And here you were thinking that his music was whiny before. <laughs> it's going to get really bad. Go on. Just sign on the yellow line. Uh, Packers <laughs> quarterback Aaron Rodgers says he once saw a UFO. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. Although, you know, disclaimer, in Wisconsin, unidentifiable, unidentifiable objects include things like salad. <laughs> <laughs>
definitely much less gangster With a star like this on a day like this It's good to do this white boy prankster I don't push your bands like my BW Drive an old drop top, it's what I love to do And it gets me to work on time To say hello to you On your radio, mad money, no But I love what I do on the radio Hear me yell the whole night through I'm feeling so lucky that I can be The voice that you hear in this great big city I rock on your radio All good. Sunshine, I could not wait. Nothing's gonna change how I feel today. Nothing's gonna get in the way of my perfect day, perfect day. Sunshine, I could not wait. Nothing's gonna change how I feel today. Nothing's gonna get in the way of my perfect day, perfect day. It's all what you make of it. It's all what you make of it, yeah. Something happening here, and you should know what it is. <laughs> the dumbing up of America. No more AD on the radio. Does a 12-year-old pinching another 12-year-old's butt constitute sexual battery? That is a question we are being asked, predicated on what happened in this past week just gone by to a 12-year-old girl who pinched another 12-year-old's butt. We'll get into exactly how that happened. I'm curious to know what you think. Uh, tweet me at ADSXE or you can tweet Super Producer to the stars Barry Funkhauser at FunkFM. And uh, it's a discussion we'll have toward the end of the show. What else is going on in the world, Funkhauser? Uh, there's a petition calling for the, na- the Republican National Convention to follow to allow firearms. Uh, they want people to be allowed to bring guns into the Republican National Convention. To be fair, a gun comes in handy, though, when you want to shoot yourself after Donald Trump reminds you what an ugly loser you are. So, yeah. That's interesting. That's an interesting one. Because in Texas, in Texas, the idea of open carry means that you should be able to walk right up to the Capitol building in Austin with a shotgun and nobody can do or say anything about it. That's what the idea of open carry is. And it's viewed as being parts of our liberty. Now, generally speaking, I find most of the gun owners I know in Texas to be responsible sorts who don't do that sort of thing. Because, let's be real here, while it falls within the realms of something that you're allowed to do as as dictated by your rights as a Texan, it's going to raise a few eyebrows. And is it sensible? Probably not. It's like those folks that carry guns into places like Starbucks and Costco and wherever the hell else they want to be demonstrative of the fact that this is their right to do so. So it raises an interesting question. Firearms in the the Republican National Convention. In theory, in theory, it should be allowed. In reality... And this is one of those things. This is one of those things, isn't it? This is one of those things that, uh, if it's not allowed, I mean, depending on where uh, where these sorts of things happen going forward. I mean, first and foremost, you got to take a look at the law of the land. But if there are gatherings of the Republican National Convention in different places, some of which allow open carry, well then, it raises a question. Can you walk in with a shotgun? Clearly visible. And one of my friends, one of my friends who is a staunch gun rights advocate and believes in his right to own a firearm. And this is, this is my buddy Ramon, works over at KPRC, one of the stations that carries us, the one in, in Houston. He happens to think that 
Well, if there's guns protecting the president's kid, if there's Secret Service, if there's all sorts of firearms between a potential attacker and the children of the president, don't tell him he's not allowed to have his between a potential attacker and his beautiful baby boy, July Augustus, who is a beautiful baby boy. And it raises a question. It raises a very interesting and pertinent question. Now, look, when the Republican National Convention gathers, it depends on where they happen to be. And there are going to be laws of the land. But if it's in a place where open carry is allowed, this is where those, uh, this is where the, um, this is where the, the idea of gun rights gets a little sticky. We'll wait and see how that all plays out. Go on. What else? Um... I lost my window. Where's my window? Here it is. Mm. Uh, yesterday was Easter. Oh, no. Did I tell you about Ted Cruz? The biggest story to all of last week? The National Enquirer claims Ted Cruz had five mistresses. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, so, you know, there's a visual for those of you looking for a new way to suppress your appetite. <laughs> there's a lot of things I like about Ted. Ted Cruz really, like, Ted Cruz is one of those guys that really conflicts me. Because, like, I've spent some time in Texas. Now... A lot of the rest of the country says Ted Cruz is a wackadoo. That's danger money. He's too much of a Bible thumper to be allowed to have his finger on the button. He's too much of a Bible thumper that believes that people that believe what he believes are closer to God and therefore in some way entitled to more. Now, this is not me saying that about Ted Cruz. These are the criticisms of Ted Cruz that have been leveled at me when I say there's some, some things about there's some things about what he says and does that I really like. So there's people that are really concerned about that. I guess it's the it is the Bible thumping side of Ted Cruz that I think freaks a lot of people out. And for me, uh, uh, for me, I, I just 100 percent can't abide by the idea of religion making its way into politics and politics making its way into religion. I think that is a recipe for corruption like almost nothing else. It is a recipe for disaster like almost nothing else. And yet, as much as we uh, are supposed to have some sort of separation of church and state, it seems if you want to run, if you want to run on the GOP ticket, if you want to get votes of anyone on the right, at this moment, you got to kind of come across like you're heading toward a theocratic Christian right state. Which is tremendously limiting and hard to deal with for a lot of folks. It's a conflicting thing. A lot of people are just like, look, conservative. I'm a conservative. But I don't believe the idea of religion should be involved in politics whatsoever. Yet if you're going to be a conservative, if you're going to vote for a conservative, you're going to vote with someone who purports to be a Bible thumper. It's a weird dichotomy, and I think a big part of the reason why the right is so divided. A lot of people find the idea of religion. Some very religious people I know find the idea of religion in politics unbelievably dangerous. And if you want to vote for someone on the right, you're going to be voting for someone. Well, look, Donald Trump, Donald Trump, I don't think, is overly religious, but he was grilled on religion. You know, hey, you want to be, uh, you want to be the Republican nominee for president? You want to be the Republican nominee for president? Name some of your favorite parts of the Bible. This was a question that was asked to Donald Trump. And he had to he had to justify his level of Christianity. So, it's a bit disheartening for a lot of people that have conservative values or are, who are fiscally conservative. But really, as they might be, you might be as big a, I know people that are just as big a Bible basher as anyone that's running for president as evangelical as they get, and they still feel it's not a good idea to have religion involved in politics. And I have to say, I agree with them. And here's the thing about Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz, a lot of the rest of the country is kind of scared of him. But if you've been in Texas when he's been advocating for the people in Texas, when he's not scared of playing patty cake with folks in Washington, when he's not scared to mess, up, mess with the program, when he's not interested in playing patty cake with folks in Washington... You've seen him in action. You've seen that he really does have legitimate public concern. He really does care for the people of Texas and care for the people of America, I think. 
So there's a lot of things about him that are just fantastic that inspire tons of confidence, and then a lot of things about him that give me the screaming effing heebie-jeebies. Um, but uh, the idea of him getting busy with five different women is something I find a scotch stomach-turning. It's just something, like, politics aside, just something about his face. <laughs> something about... It's not that his face bothers me, it's just the idea of, of his face whilst engaged in a certain act. I find that very difficult to shake. So I'll thank the National Enquirer to leave that story alone, if only for the sake of my lunch. Go on. Yesterday was Easter. Mm-hmm. Yep. Nobody found the Easter eggs I hid, only because I hid him inside a movie theater showing my big fat Greek wedding too. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe that's a thing. I really can't. Well, like the woman two. who wrote that, who was responsible for, well, two, like 20 years later, right? Like the sequel 20 years later, uh, it's about okay. her kid's wedding or something. I'm not, I don't know. But like the woman who wrote that, I, I, I seem to remember she had a bit of an inspiring story. I saw the movie back in the day. It was cute. I liked it. I mean, it's not like my go-to, but you know, I, I didn't think it was bad. But I think the woman, I think it was kind of like a Sylvester Stallone story with that movie where like. Sylvester Stallone had a treatment for Rocky, and he shopped it everywhere. And every single every single movie studio was like, "We'll totally buy this off of you. This is awesome." And he's like, "Well, you have to cast me in the lead role." And they're like, <laughs> "No," and he refused to make the movie until he was cast in the lead role. And I can't remember exactly what it was, but the the woman, the big fat Greek wedding woman, Nia, Nia Vardalos, Varda, I can't remember exactly what her name is, but. She had some sort of, like, compelling story about this being really her idea from the ground up that she hustled and bustled to get it made, and um, it was this monumental smash hit. The second one, not so much, but the first one, good job. Inspiring story. Good stuff. Go on. What else? A woman who publicly admitted she had to hide her own poop in her purse after her date's toilet didn't flush is getting lots of offers for dates because she's super hot. I know about this story. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And didn't she, like, live tweet it while it was happening? Yeah. Or, like, she told the story, and, yeah, she she had to use her date's bathroom. She did something unspeakable in it. It clogged up. And so uh, she she put the evidence of her uh, overactive dig- digestive tract in her purse. Now, some people say it's satire, that she was just making up a fun story for internet hits. And it's really kind of, like, taken over the world. Like, the story's gone around the world, like, two or three times. But, but yeah, she's now, uh, despite the fact that she's allegedly a woman who hides her own poop in her purse, getting tons of offers for dates because she's pretty easy on the eyes. I'd go out with her. I just wouldn't ask her for a piece of gum. (laughs) Let let me see. It's in here somewhere. (laughs) No, it's not. Hold on. That's not it. (laughs) No, it's not. Go on. Uh, men today are three times more likely to cry in public than their fathers. <laughs> As evidenced by our friend Alex Jones. Um, <coughs> when I hear stuff like this, I just can't help feeling that somehow, somehow, we've uh, let Chuck Norris down. What, what else, Funkhauser? <coughs> uh... A new study found that most of, most of uh, America's fattest cities are in the deep south. Mm, more like the deep fried south. Am Whoa, I right? Oh, tasty. <laughs> Go on. It's spring break time for many college students. Get off the road. Leave me alone. Mm-hmm. Shut up. <laughs> if you are going on spring break, you, you want to bear a couple things in mind. You want to consider the smartest, most responsible thing to do in every situation, then do the exact opposite. <laughs> you want to... Uh, Go ahead and get that tattoo on the back of your neck because you're not going to regret it. Uh, this spring break, when it comes to cornrows, no need to stop with the hair on your head. <laughs> then remember, ladies, the hotter you are, the more likely it is that everything he's telling you is a lie. Try not to be depressed if the only chick who offers you the opportunity to do body shots off of her looks like Mama June's slightly heavier and younger sister. If you're spending... If you're spending spring break in Cabo San Lucas or Cancun, you can leave the Trump shirts at home. And uh, don't forget, drug balloons take time. Don't force it. <laughs> oh, man. We didn't even have time to get to it today. We'll talk about the uh, we'll talk about the girl who has been charged with sexual battery after pinching a classmate's butt tomorrow. 
because, you know, we tackle the big issues on this show. Hey, thank you so much for being a part of my radio family. Days like today, I appreciate you more than ever. Have yourself an awesome one. Happy Monday.